So listen, with Pastor Tom, now I know you guys don't know Pastor Tom, but I'm actually working on trying to get him to come and be a special speaker. I'm working with his son who's in Midland. He's 76 years old, so he doesn't travel quite as easily as he used to. Any older folks can relate to that, right? So uh, he lives down in uh, the northwest part of Houston. So we're trying to bring him out here, and I'll let you know when that's going to be. But one of the things I, I love about Pastor Tom, I've known him for, I think, 35 years. He was one of the very first pastors that I met when I was a young Foursquare pastor. I think I was 23 or 24 years old at a pastor's retreat. And how many of you know, sometimes older guys can look down at the younger guys, right? It's like, you're young. And I was young. And, uh, but he was just so loving and so kind. And he made a great impression on me even back then. But one of the things about Pastor Tom that he said that really struck my heart, so much so I took some notes of some things that resonated in my heart to share with you guys, and this is one of them. And one of the things he said was this. He said, it wasn't until he was about 52 years old that he came to the point in his life where he learned to be still before God as a part of his prayer life. And he said, at first, it took him like three hours to silence his mind. Have you guys ever tried to be quiet for 30 minutes? Any of you who are more vocacious? It's a fancy word for talkative. It's hard. It's really hard. So he said, at first, it took him about three hours to get to that point. But one of the things he realized is that if he gave Holy Spirit a chance to speak, the Lord is and will speak to us all the time. Everybody say all the time. The problem is not with Father speaking. The problem is with us stilling ourselves enough to listen and to hear and to obey. Amen? And I share all the time with people that we've got to get to the place where our walk with the Father is much more applicable. There's much more application of what we know. Too many people have all the information. They're not doing anything with it. Can you imagine if the body of Messiah across this nation alone began to do just half the stuff that we know? Some of us have been in congregations for decades. We know a lot of stuff. But chances are we're not doing much. So my encouragement for us as we get to this this morning is let's learn to be still as part of our prayer life. And what you're going to find is transformation takes place that's more than information. Information is important. But more important is Holy Spirit transformation where he takes the information you have and he uses it to transform your life. Someone say amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you, we love you. We thank you, Father, that every word of God is yes and amen in Messiah Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit to speak through me to these, your people, this morning. Let every word spoken be a word in season. We pray, Father, that you would give us hearing ears, seeing eyes, and a heart that would ponder and understand your truth to apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, before I left for the men's retreat, we had said there were five things that quench the Holy Spirit and quench your prayers. You know what it means to quench, right? It means to put a fire out. At one of the uh, functions we had for the men's retreat, we had a beautiful fire in the fireplace at the dining hall late at night after our meeting in the chapel, and we roasted some s'mores out there. It was supposed to be outside, but it was too cold outside, and I knew if we had it outside, none of the guys would have attended. it. And so we had it in the dining hall. But listen, at the end of the night, the staff had to come and quench that fire. They had to put that fire out. So anything that quenches is something that puts it out. And here are some things we talked about two weeks ago that put out your prayers, and one of them is the defilement of sin. Sin will quench your prayers. 
Addiction to things of the flesh will quench your prayers. Someone say amen. The Lord wants us completely and totally sold out to him. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Someone say amen. Now, y'all know next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Everybody say Resurrection Sunday. Y'all know we don't celebrate Easter, amen? Easter is pagan. Everybody say pagan. We don't deal with chickens and rabbits, except to cook them and eat them. Can't eat rabbit. I can't. It's not kosher, but chickens you can eat. But Resurrection Sunday has everything to do with Jesus being raised to new life And those who would become believers in him would also be raised to new life. He's given you and I new life. And we ruin and quench what he's trying to do in our life through the addictions of the flesh and through the defilement of sin. You and I, we said, have got to learn to love God more than we love that sin. Amen? Anybody says, I love God and doesn't keep his commandments, Jesus said, you don't love me. Plain and simple. Then we said, praying with doubt. We said that doubt quenches prayer. Amen? Doubt quenches prayer. You know, some people want to limit God. They'll believe the Lord for this, but not for anything else. He is still the same. And I shared with somebody last night, I said, you know, yesterday afternoon, I said, one day I'm going to depart from this earth. One way or another, It's going to happen. If you're looking for science to give you eternal life, (laughs) sorry, you're you're looking in the wrong direction. Completely, 180 degrees, the wrong direction. Some former Google CEO came out with an article this last week saying he thinks in 10 years nanobots will give human beings eternal life. Listen, when Antichrist, listen to me, When Antichrist shows up on the scene, he's going to come promising eternal life. And it's going to be a counterfeit fake. I say all that to say this. One day we're going home to be with the Lord. I want to go out believing and trusting. I lost my best friend this last year, Dante, to cancer. And he was on his deathbed and he said, you know what? He said, Bruce, he said, my body is racked with pain. I'm eating up with disease. And if I go home, I go home, but I'm still going to trust God until that final day. I love that. And he went home. So be it. But if you're going to go, go out believing God. Someone say amen. amen. And the last thing we covered two weeks ago is we said prayer must sometimes be done at challenging times. Listen, guys, don't wait till... All of your life is falling apart before you learn to have a prayer time with the Lord. How many of you know we say all the time we believe the worst parts of the Bible are ahead of us? I say worst parts. I'm talking about revelation. I'm talking about the judgment that's coming on the world. So how many of you think now would be a good time to establish a foundation of prayer in our life? When the going's easy, amen? Amen, Pastor. So you can catch up on that on a video. All that was free. But I want to continue with four or five, and they have to relate about being still before God. So these five things that quench the Holy Spirit and quench persistent prayer in our life. Number four is not being distracted from prayer. Everybody say not distracted. How many of you know that's easier said than done? Wow. I want to look at some scripture here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above where Christ is, where Messiah is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things what? Above, not on things on the earth. Look at your neighbor and say, set your mind on things above. Satan is a master of causing distractions especially during prayer time. Never fails. I have prayer with the pastors on Wednesdays. For the last three Wednesdays, it never fails. There's been something to keep me from trying to go. Some contractor being late, some person showing up that wasn't invited to come meet with me. I mean, there was something that comes up to keep me from praying. 
with these other guys. And how many of you know, even in your own personal prayer time, you've got to set aside a time that has no distractions. The Bible calls that literally a prayer closet, right? A place to pray in secret. Jesus prayed. Jesus walked, hiked up a mountain to get alone with God. Sometimes you've got to work at getting alone and getting still. Amen? And sometimes it takes work. How many of you know sometimes the way people live from the time they wake up till the time they sleep, they are bombarded completely and totally with distraction? I mean, the dogs need to be fed, the cat's meowing, the phone's ringing, the mobile phone, the notifications, the text, the this, the job, the that, that, that. Listen, in this life, it's always going to be filled with distraction. Matter of fact, I would say there's probably not going to be a time in your life ex except when you escape to a retreat or a mountaintop where your life doesn't have distraction. The key, and, and Brian said this so well, the key is this. How do you come back from a mountaintop experience and apply those things in your life to where you can have some non-distractive time alone with the Father. Alone with the Father. Amen? I've always said, why is it that God's people have such a hard time spending time in prayer? Spending time in prayer. I really don't understand it. But I think part of it is we allow ourselves to do busy work. There's nothing wrong with being busy for the Lord. Someone say amen. Nothing wrong with being busy in life. Martha, how many of you know she was busy, right? So I say it like this. We need to be Martha's with the Mary's heart. Stay busy for the Lord, but let your heart be at that place where you're just one to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear from the Father. Amen? Listen, guys. The thing that separates you from the religious is that we have a relationship with him. And that relationship needs to be fresh and new every morning and every day. Someone say amen. If you can be easily distracted, Satan will distract you. Let me give you some distractions. Let me throw these out there. Television could be a distraction. Amen. News can be a distraction. YouTube can be a distraction. Animals can be distractions. Spouses can be distractions, right? If you see your spouse sitting there having quiet time, don't decide to give them a honeydew list at that moment. All the spouses said, amen. I've learned somewhat when my wife's alone spending her time with her coffee and the Bible, thank you, Steve, leave her alone, amen, because if I mess with her, she's going to tell me about it. I'm spending time with the Lord. Leave me alone. So it's better for me just to learn to leave her alone to begin with. Amen? So I'm just saying, guys, distractions are out there. The key is you and I have to get to the point where you make a conscious decision to set before him. Say, Father, I want your will, your desire to be done in my life this day. Lord, I'm going to open your word. You speak to me through your scripture. Reveal your scripture to me, Father. Let me hear your voice. Listen, this world is full of voices, guys, and they're all calling for your attention. And when they're not, you got spam guys calling for your attention, right? Thank the Lord the phones say spam. No, block. <laughs> Ten times a day, right? Everybody wants your attention. It's not going to get easier. I'll tell you what, I believe it's going to get worse. Why? Because the enemy uses that to keep God's people from seeking his face. Every saint has experienced his mind wandering, causing him to think about everything except what he should be praying about. We do it in service, right, guys? Sometimes we're sitting here pastors preaching a good word or a not good word. Let y'all decide that. And our mind's wandering. Well, I've got this this evening and this, and the ball game starts at this time. You've got to discipline your mind. You've got to do what the Scripture says and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
All that stuff's going to be there when you leave. But this time we have together to hear his word and to be encouraged with testimony and to worship, it's precious to God. And we need to focus our minds. Someone say amen. amen. So sometimes we try to get alone and we're thinking about everything than what we should be praying about. And the scripture says to set your thing, your mind on things, what? Above. Above. That shouldn't be an afterthought. That should be the way we live our life. It's focused on the things that Father's focused on. Someone say amen. The enemy knows if we're constantly distracted by the noise of the world, it will keep us from hearing God's voice. Amen? It will keep us from hearing God's voice. Now, some of you guys, I love watching a good video, okay? But when you're trying to watch 15 videos a day and you have no time to spend with God, maybe you need less videos and more Jesus. Less man's noise and more God's voice. Because he is speaking to you. He is speaking to me. The question is, will I tune in to hear him? Amen. When I think about this Palm Sunday, listen, what's he speaking to us today? What's he speaking to us? I'll tell you what he's speaking. This is the word of the Lord. He wants his people in the United States of America, this is where we live, to learn to know him again. Not to have information about him, but to know him. To know him. So you don't end up a big, fat, spiritual Pharisee, but you end up a man or a woman of faith, a son and daughter bought with the blood, filled with the Spirit, actively doing his will today for your life. Therefore, when he, can, he, Satan, cannot destroy us, he distracts us. He distracts us. But the good news is, you don't have to say yes. You don't have to give in to that. Someone say amen. How many of you know God's given you free will? You could just say, nope, I'm turning it off. Nope, I'm turning it off. Nope, I'm turning it off. Amen? Martha was distracted by good works. Luke chapter 10, right? I say, if you're going to be a Martha, be a Martha with a Mary's heart. Samson was distracted from his purpose, right? David was distracted from what he was supposed to do. The Bible says at a time when kings go out to war, David stayed home. And when he stayed home, guess who distracted him? Woo, beautiful Bathsheba, Sheba, bathing on the rooftop. But it was at a time when kings go out to make war. He was supposed to be with his men, leading them in battle, but he's not. He's distracting. He's at home. A lot of men at home instead of leading. A lot of men distracted with stuff instead of leading and doing what they're supposed to be doing before God. Taking care of your walk with the Lord and taking care of your family. Amen. Five things that quench the Holy Spirit and quench persistent prayer. Number five is discouraged over delays to answer prayer. Well, God, God just took too long to answer, and so I quit praying. Well, how long have you been praying? Well, twice, two days. Okay. Well, how long have we been praying for the kingdom of God to come to earth as it is in heaven? Thousands of years. It will come, but it's not here yet. Someone say amen. amen. Sometimes our prayers are stored up to be answered and released by the Father in His good timing. But our job is to pray and to believe and to trust. Everybody say to trust. Amen. To believe and to trust. Colossians again, chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not grow weary while doing good. Don't grow weary in your prayer life. Don't grow weary in talking to the Father. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, in the situation of prayer, reaping would be having your prayers answered. Amen? 
But you can't grow weary. You can't say, well, Lord, I prayed once for 30 seconds and nothing happened, so I'm done. Man, you've got to sometimes pray and fast and fast and pray and pray and fast and seek the Lord until He gives you an answer. Even if it's not the answer you're praying for, He'll bring you an answer. Few things cause us to lose heart in praying more than delays and answers to our request. But you have to remember that a day with the Lord is is a thousand years. Someone say amen. God is not late in answering his prayers. Though answers often appear to take a long time in coming, we should persevere and not grow weary in praying to God. Someone say amen to that. Luke 18, 1, they spoke a parable to them. This is Jesus, our Lord, speaking. He said that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Men ought to pray and not faint. Not lose heart means don't give up. Don't quit. Well, I prayed for this or for that healing or for this brother or for that sister or for this relationship to get saved and nothing's happened. Keep praying. Everybody say, keep praying. You don't quit. No retreat, no surrender, no give up. It's not there, right? Learning to still your soul before God. This is a tough one. Or am I the only one? How can we be led by the Spirit if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit? I wrote that down at the men's retreat. It was, I don't know if somebody said it or if I heard it from the Lord. I can't remember. But it was so good, I stuck in my notes. And I want to read it again to you. How can we be led by the Spirit if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit? If we're believers who claim to be led by the Spirit of God, we ought to be hearing the Spirit of God in our lives. Jesus said, my sheep know my said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they're not going to follow, amen? So he wouldn't say they know my voice if he wasn't speaking to us. He's speaking all the time. The question is, am I listening? Are you listening? Look at your neighbor say, I need to listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. Now he speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us in the nudges of our heart. He speaks to us. Sometimes he gives us pictures in our spirit. But he will speak, and he is speaking. Andrew Mary wrote this. He said, each time before you pray, before you intercede, be quiet first. Everybody say, be quiet first. And worship God in his glory. Think of what he can do and how he delights to hear the prayers of his redeemed people. Think of your place and privilege in Messiah and expect great things. But that first part, each time before you pray, before you intercede, to pray on behalf of another, be quiet first. How many of you know some of us have a hard time being quiet? Y'all all smiling at me. Okay, I'll take. I'm actually more quiet than you think. When people come and speak with me, 90% of counseling is listening. It's not speaking. It's listening and learning to listen to other people. And spouses, how many of you know that oftentimes we hear, but we don't always listen? Or am I the only one that does that too? Okay, Whew, thank you. I was thinking I was the only one, brother. <laughs> Holy Spirit wants us to learn to listen, guys. But to listen, you've got to be quiet. You've got to be quiet. And I shared with the men at the men's retreat. When my wife and I, when we were young, in our 20s, there was a uh, professional intercessor. Professional, he was paid on staff. It was somebody who was a famous preacher in the world. And he had resigned from that position. And somebody very wealthy had loaned him 
a beautiful mansion to use for the summer. He had the mansion to him and his wife. He had a chef. And he invited my wife and I to come spend a week with him and his wife at this mansion. And we were pastoring, and we had never stayed in I mean, we lived in like a little one-bedroom apartment at that time, I think. And so we went. It was gorgeous. I mean, our bedroom indoors, indoor, second floor bedroom had a slide, still indoors, going to a pool. Just to give you an idea. And man, we were just having a great time. And Brother Glenn, he goes, Bruce, he said, why don't you meet me in the morning? Let's pray together. And he was an elderly gentleman. He was in probably, probably early 70s by this time. He lived into his 80s, by the way. He was one of these guys who said, Brother Bruce, he'd call me his favorite Jew. He said, you're my favorite Jew. He goes, but when I die, I'm going to die preaching the gospel with my cowboy boots on. And he invited me to pray with him. And I was a young whippersnapper. I was maybe 25 years old, 24. And I'm down there, and man, I'm just rattling off praying in tongues, and then I'm on my knees, and I'm praying in English, and I'm just going 90 miles an hour, probably for 45 minutes nonstop. And Glenn's next to me, and he's just on his knees and kind of quiet. And I got done, and I'm ready for breakfast. My prayer time was done. And he looks at me, and he says, Bruce, he goes, I love you, but when are you going to be quiet long enough for Holy Spirit to speak to you. He said, praying isn't just us talking at God. It's us learning to be still and listen to what he's saying as well. Amen? It's like a marriage relationship, right? If you're the only one yakking all the time and your wife can't never or your husband can't never enter a word in, probably not going to have good communication between y'all. Anybody ever had that happen? None of y'all, but it's happened to me. Not with my wife, with me. Clarify that so I don't get myself in trouble. But the moral of the story is you have to choose in your prayer time to be quiet before God. Now, how long you're quiet, that's between you. Man, if you're never quiet, start with a couple minutes. Start with five minutes. It might kill you. It might be the longest five minutes you've ever had in your life. Any of you have a hard time being still? It might be the longest five minutes you've ever had, but start somewhere. Pastor Tom, he said it took him three hours. Now, he was a full-time minister. Now everybody has three hours to spend just trying to silence themselves. And I'm not talking about some transcendental meditation, weird, bizarre I'm talking about where you're just trying to hear from God for your life. All that our mess is counterfeit of what God's really wanting to do in us. Someone say amen. Psalm 37, 7 through 8 as we come in for a landing. Be still before the Lord. Everybody say that. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. I love that. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. The Hebrew word that means be still means let go. Everybody say let go. Stop striving. Slacken. Let it drop. The anxiety, the fear, the Hustle, the bustle, the Martha spirit, just let it go. As hard as it is for just a few minutes. Listen, you can pick it back up. Chances are you will. Amen. But let it go for at least a few minutes to be still before God. Learn to practice this, guys. It's not a call to inaction, but it's a call to surrender our circumstances to God's sovereignty. Lord, I'm letting go. I'm being still before you. I'm giving you my mind, my distractions, all of the stuff from today. I surrender and submit it all to you, Father. 
in the name of Jesus. Learning to still yourself as part of your prayer life is to practice his presence. And you move from being a believer of information to being a person who is practicing the presence of God in your life and you're reflecting more and more of him, of Yeshua, of Jesus, and less and less of me and less and less of you. These guys were taking note of Tom and his demeanor and his peace. and That's not him. Do you understand that? That's not him. That's a reflection of the one whom he spends time with. That's who that is. And we all have access to that in our life. We only need to make the conscious decision to avail ourselves of it. Every day. Everybody say every day. I want to be still in God's presence, but it's so hard. I can't seem to stop the buzzing thoughts in my head, and it's frustrating. We heard Toby say that, right? It's frustrating. Just the going and the thinking and everything else. And I encourage the idea of spending several minutes in stillness before God, before the start of your prayer journey. Start somewhere, guys. How many of you commit to start somewhere this week with me? Amen? Start somewhere. It's important to remember that God is not a Zen-like meditative state where our minds disconnect from our body. That's not what we're talking about. But rather, the goal is to allow the peace of God to rule in our minds and in our hearts by submitting all that we are to Him and allowing His stillness to refresh our souls. How many of you need your souls refreshed every day? How many of you wash your undergarments or have them washed? Three of y'all? Your soul, I use that as a picture bomb on purpose. And only three of you raised your hand. I'm kind of worried now. Your soul needs refreshing every day. Every day your soul gets soiled from this world. You ever run to people who you're supposed to love who frustrate the tar out of you? You ever run to people that you're supposed to be sharing the gospel with and you skipped? Or your brain is somewhere else? Come on now. Our soul needs to be cleansed and renewed and transformed by his word and by his spirit. And it needs to be refreshed every day of our lives. Someone say amen. amen. Stand to our feet. In this fast-paced world, we rarely get to experience stillness and peace. How many of you know that's true? But so many scriptures speak to the importance of learning to rest in God's presence. Everybody say learning to rest in his presence. Listen, these guys weren't renewed because of the beautiful mountains of New Mexico. Because of the lack of oxygen, we were 7,400 feet up. Or because of the activities we did. They weren't refreshed because of great preaching or great worship or great music. They were refreshed because they spent time allowing Holy Spirit to transform their life. That's what refreshed them. Amen?